quite a few people, but I think we'll get going anyway. Um, so I thought I'd start with uh, for the opening prayer tonight, since it uh, the feast day that will be coming up, not this weekend, but next weekend, is the Feast of Corpus Christi, right? So it's a special celebration of, of the body and blood of Jesus. And so I think I'd start with the the collect, the opening prayer for Mass, as kind of the opening prayer for us today. So we can begin in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O God, who in this wonderful sacrament have left us a memorial of your passion, grant us, we pray, so to revere the sacred mysteries of your body and blood, that we may always experience in ourselves the fruits of your redemption. We live and reign with God the Father in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. It's kind of interesting about that prayer. If you ever, if you listen to the end of it, to live and reign with you, uh, with uh, the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever, is kind of normally, uh, oftentimes, how this one ended. But in this, because most of the prayers that we do are addressed to the Father, so how, so how it ends is differently. But this one is actually uh, addressed to Jesus, and it, that's why it kind of ends differently than other ones. We live and reign with God the Father in the unity, the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. It's just a little bit of a different thing. Um, one of the things that I wanted to do, you know, is I mentioned last weekend or week before, you know, that the Mass that we celebrate, even though it's varied in language from time to time, the overall format of it has been unchanged for a very, very long time. The, um, you know, we're talking about, you know, how in the Acts of the Apostles, one of the earliest things that the Apostles did after Pentecost was they were getting together for the breaking of the bread and prayers. Um, but even the early church adopted the format of the Eucharist quite uh, quite soon. And so I want to show up. I, I, I got, grabbed this one from Word on Fire, but St. Justin Martyr, actually, I think his feast day wasn't that long ago, um, was uh, an early apologist of the church. An apologist, and this means someone who makes a response. Um, to uh, to people who are challenging the church. And so I, this one, this ex excerpt came from um, Word on Fire, which is Bishop Robert Barron's website. But what's important to note about this is written between 153 and 155 AD. So here he's writing to um, a Roman emperor, I think, or somebody, somebody like that. And, um, but what his description of is what's very interesting about this, right? So here's Justin on the Eucharist. All right. But we, after we have washed him, washed him who has been convinced and has assented to our teaching, bring him to the place where those who are called brethren are assembled in order that we may offer hearty prayers in common for ourselves and for all the baptized. And for all others in every place that we may be counted worthy now that we have learned the truth by our works, also to be found good citizens, keepers of the commandments, so we may be saved in everlasting salvation. Having ended the prayers, we salute one another with a kiss. Then there is brought to the present, um, which is really the, a sign of peace, right? Um, then there's brought to the president of the brethren, bread and a cup of wine mixed with water. And he taking them gives praise and glory to the father of the universe through the name of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, and offers thanks at considerable length for our being counted worthy to receive these things at his hands. And when he has concluded the prayers of thanksgiving, all the people assent to their, uh, express their assent by saying amen, right? That, the great amen that's at the end of the Eucharistic prayer. The word amen comes from the Hebrew language, meaning so be it. When the president has given thanks and all the people have expressed their assent, those who are called... Uh, by us deacons, give to each of those present to partake of the bread and wine mixed with water, over which the thanksgiving was pronounced, and to those who are absent, carry away a portion. 
know, it's, it, so it, what's interesting about that, right? You can see very much the mass that's in, you know, that's in what he wrote somewhere between 153 and 155 AD, right? So this is only a couple generations removed from those early disciples. This was not, you know, so the mass as we know it is not some sort of later invention. You know, things have refined, have changed a little bit, sure. But the mass is at its central core is something that has been going on from the earliest days of the church. I always find that a very fascinating thing, frankly. So anyway, all right, so let me get back to that. All right. So uh, we're on our last piece here. And we went through the Eucharistic prayer up through that, I think was the last part where we left off. And now we've gotten to uh, the communion rite. So read the prayers for the final part of the liturgy of the Eucharist known as the communion rite. Read the prayers for the concluding rites is to take you to the Lord's Prayer in line with God Prayer. Uh, okay. All right. Answering the following questions will help you understand scriptural roots of the communion, right? In the liturgy of the Eucharist and the concluding rites at Mass. All right. Liturgy of the Eucharist, the communion, right? The Lord's Prayer, Our Father. One way the priest invites the people to pray the Our Father is with these words the Savior's command. Formed by divine teaching, we dare to say. All right, so is you've heard that me say that a lot. CCC 277. Okay. This way is a lot easier to find, but it's not as easy to read, unfortunately. Um, so, the Our Father. Um, the Roman liturgy, the Eucharistic assembly, is invited to pray to our Heavenly Father with filial boldness, right? Sons and daughter boldness. The Eastern liturgies develop and use these similar expressions, dare in all confidence, make us worthy of. From the burning bush, Moses heard a voice to say to him, do not come near, put off your shoes from your feet for the place which you are standing is holy ground. Only Jesus could cross that threshold of divine holiness, but when he had made purification for sins, he brought us into the Father's presence. Here I am and the children God has given me. This power of the Spirit who introduces us to the Lord's prayers expressed in the liturgies of East and West by the beautiful, characteristically Christian expression, uh, got no idea how to pronounce that, straightforward simplicity, filial trust, joyful assurance, bold, humble boldness, Certainty of being loved. Okay, those are the two. Right, so th this is talking about that introductory phrase. And then into the Our Father itself. Uh, shortly, in what sense do we dare to say Our Father? What is so daring about reciting this prayer? Anybody got any thoughts about that? Well, I kind of thought that um, just acknowledging that it's a privilege to address him as our father, meaning a more intimate relationship versus a very, um, instead of a, a formal addressing, you, you're you asked to address him in a, in a more for, informal way as our father. Right. You know, it's kind of an expression of the relationship he wants to have with us, right? We're talking about somebody who's all powerful, you know, all knowing and whatnot, but really wants to have like a parent child relationship with us and not be something that's 
you know, worshiped as this far off, distant thing, you know? So it's an expression of, you know, that closeness that he wants to have with us, which is very, un, you know, unlike all the other, you know, false pantheons of gods kind of thing. Anything else from anybody? Yeah, in that in that spirit, we're we're approaching him with humility and and awe and trust, um, and, and understanding that relationship that re relationship that we that we have with him. Okay, very good. All right, so then we get into the fraction, right? Breaking of the bread. Shortly before communion, the priest breaks the Eucharistic host in a rite known as the fraction or breaking of bread. The expression breaking of bread was associated with Christian worship in the New Testament. See Acts uh, 2, 42, 40, and 46. You can look at that, but I think it's going to be... Yeah, this is what we were talking about before. Um, you know, so Peter's made his Pentecost speech. And then it gets to the end of that about all those who were, uh, you know, accepted his message, were baptized. About 3,000 persons were added in that day. Then it goes into talking about the communal life. Right, then the, the disciples gathering together. So, and then it talks about what that is. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to the communal life, to the breaking of the bread, and to the prayers. Right? So, if you kind of distill down the essence of the Eucharist, right, that's kind of what it is. So, that fraction, right, that breaking of, uh, of the bread is really a tie back to all these other. Um, you know, mentions of the Eucharist, you know, of, um, you know, the uh, multiplication of the loaves, you know, when Jesus took that bread, broke it apart, and it, you know, through that miracle was able to, with just a couple of loaves, feed, you know, multiple multitudes of people, you know, three, five thousand, whatever, right, numbers of people. So there's, that reminds us of that. And the same thing too at the Last Supper. You know, he took bread, blessed, broke it, and then gave it, you know, to the disciples. All right. Um, 1, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10, 16, 17. So this will be about the Eucharist for sure. All right, because the loaf of bread is one, we though many are one body and we all partake of the one loaf, right? So, so what does it, you know, in this it's talking about the unity, right? That the loaf of bread is one, even though there are many pieces to it, you know, that we make up part of the body of Christ. We who are many parts, we are all, you know, that song, right? We all... <laughs> We are many parts, but we're all one body, right? Um, you know, so the, the loaf, even though it's broken apart and given to everyone, is really, it's reconstituted in us, you know, that we now, who have shared in Jesus, you know, are making up the, the one loaf, the one that, who is the body of Christ. Unifying. Right, yes. Um... So think about it in light of this biblical background, what would be the significance of the priest breaking the Eucharistic host at this moment before Holy Communion? Well, it goes back to um, the Old Testament when the Jewish people before a meal would break the bread and share it with those present and say a blessing before they broke the bread. Okay, so was there one time in particular that kind of 
the, 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 the Last Supper. Right, the Last Supper, which was a Passover meal, right? right. So um, they talked about that in the book, about how at that Passover Seder, you know, that they were sitting down and there was bread that they shared. And so, you know, Jesus doing that at the Last Supper connects all of that stuff together. So when we do it at the Eucharist, it's a, it's a, not only, you know, recalling what Jesus did, but it's all of that salvation history stuff all kind of wrapped up in one moment. And that by that fraction, we're going to receive now of that. You know, so it's, um, it's this great thing that connects us with Jesus, with scripture. It's kind of the fulfillment of all of that stuff. All right. On you stay, the Lamb of God. In the prayer known as the On you stay, the people address Jesus as the Lamb of God. This image recalls the Old Testament Passover lamb. On the night of Israel's liberation from Egypt, God instructed the people to sacrifice a lamb, eat of it, and mark their do doorposts with the lamb, blood of the lamb. Those who participated in this ritual, called the Passover, would be spared the tenth plague that would soon hit the land of Egypt, the death of the firstborn sons. Each year thereafter, subsequent generations of Israelites celebrated the Passover, by retelling and reenacting the events of that first Passover. This annual Passover feast included the sacrifice of the Passover lambs. The following passages that depict Jesus as a lamb. What does the Bible say about Jesus the lamb in these verses? John 1 29. Just look at a couple of these. <laughs> For John 129, it was the next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Right. So in John's Gospel, this was when um, John and, you know, uh, Jesus interact for the first time when he sees, sees him. Um, this is his statement, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Right. So now think about where we're at in the Mass when that happens. What's happening right then when the priest says those words? You are holding up the host. Right. So where we're at, I just pulled up the order of the mass here. The priest, so think about it, you know, all those times when we're doing something, we're told to do it, right? So, um, you know, so, you know, we've done the Lamb of God. And then you'll notice that the priest says a prayer um, quietly. Sometimes the microphone will pick it up when I say it or whatever, but there's two choices. I have a way of which I pick which one, but because I do all of that stuff that way, I'm weird. Um, but, uh, you know, as to which one I do when, but. Um, right, so may the receiving your body and blood, Lord Jesus Christ, not bring me to judgment and condemnation. Let your loving mercy be for me a protection in mind and body and a healing remedy. Then the priest genuflex takes the host and holding it slightly raised above the patent or above the chalice. Most priests do the chalice, but every once in a while you'll see a priest do the patent. Sometimes the chalices are way too damn much to hold it up there that long. Um, but, uh, we're facing the people aloud say behold the lamb of god behold him who takes away the sins of the world blessed are those who are called to the supper of the lamb right so holding that up right so you can see it and that's you know our response you know to this you know just like john the baptist you know behold you know jesus who is the lamb of god and then what's interesting is, you know, our response to that, right? Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. I know I'm kind of skipping ahead because um, I just want to remember if you remember where that came from, that wording. We'll hit it. It's in the book. We're going to get to it in a minute, but since we're already looking at it, the centurion. Right, the centurion, right? They came to Jesus 
wanted him to heal his servant, I believe, if I remember the story, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the way Jesus interacted with pagans was very interesting how it was different, uh, you know, with pagans who had faith um, versus the Israelites, because the Jewish people, that oftentimes he didn't go. He would just say, go, they're healed. He didn't go to their place. <laughs> you know what I mean? But he did go to the homes or whatever of the Jewish people. You know, when, um, you know, the synagogue official came up and said that their child was dying. Well, Jesus made his way to the house and he got there in the, in the, um, they're saying, oh, you know, he's dead, you know, don't bother. And he said, no, no, it's asleep. And then put everybody out and then uh, raised her up. But when it was dealing with, you know, Romans or something like that, he would oftentimes, the miracle would just take place because that person had this kind of basic kind of faith, a belief that in the power that he had. In, in some ways, a lot of those, uh, the Romans or whatever that came to him showed a greater faith than the Jewish people did. It's like they had to see it. But the Romans, like, you know, there was more to that conversation you know, the centurion would come up and, you know, came up to him and said, you know, I command people and I tell them you do this and they do that or do that and they do that, you know, because he has that authority. And and Jesus understood by what he said. He's like, he believes that Jesus has that kind of power. And so, um, you know, the centurion said, you know, you're not, I'm not worthy to have you to come to my house. But if you, you know, you will it my son, you know, will be, or my servant will be healed. And Jesus commended him for his faith and said, you know, he's healed. And the centurion went on his way. So it's kind of one of those things. It's a, it's a, you know, it's our kind of participation in that kind of belief that we believe that that truly is now Jesus that's up there. All right. Um, where do we want to go? So what does this, all of this kind of tell us about the significance of calling Jesus the Lamb of God at Mass? That he is the sacrifice or he was the sacrifice for us, for our forgiveness of our sins. Right, a lot of those scripture readings, right, brought back into that whole idea of the Paschal Lamb right, of, of Jesus being uh, the Paschal Lamb and who is being um, sacrificed. And um, so it's a, it's a recalling and believing of that. But also this part, you know, with John the Baptist of not being just, you know, that he um, is the Lamb who's taking away the sins of the world, but he's the one to follow, right? Because what happened after that is some of it, when John the Baptist made that statement, some of his disciples went off and started to follow after Jesus, pointing out that, you know, that uh, John's role was to test, it was not the light, but he was to testify to the light, right? That Jesus is the one. Okay. Uh, anything else anybody think of about that? Just that there's the reference in Isaiah chapter 53, the suffering servant. Yep. And foreshadows or predicts what, what will happen. Right. It's part of the um, Good Friday readings. The suffering, well, there's se several suffering servants, but that one is the one that's Good Friday. Okay. So let's look at Exodus 12, 21. Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, go procure lambs for your families and slaughter the Passover victims. What did God instruct the Israelites to do with the Passover lamb? Yeah. 
take some what are your, what's your thought on the uh, hyssop? What kind of branch is that? And what, why was it so significant? I mean, it was used in the Old Testament here, but it, we'll find that it was also used in the New Testament. What's, what's its significance? In the New Testament, it's tying it back to this. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's part of uh, the, the, the purpose of specifically mentioning it in the New Testament was to tie back to this whole notion of the Paschal Lamb. Why it was important yeah. here at this moment other than it's some sort of leafy bush thing. Um, uh, let's see what the let's see what the footnotes say. Maybe it says something interesting. Plant with many small woody branches that was convenient for a sprinkling rite. Sprinkling right. Uh, yes, one of my favorite things. So is that going to be a better sprinkling device than your, your brush? I don't um, think so. No? I mean, well, I mean it's significant. So. It would be significant, yes. <laughs> but if we actually had hyssop around here, have to consider it. Yeah. yeah. But it would, it would not throw as well, I don't think. <laughs> Definitely would not, you know, re-baptize Kamud as well. I know that. Then it would become a sprinkling rite rather than a drowning rite. True. All right. Uh, he seemed to keep his head above water, so. Yeah. Well, he, he noticed he ducked down, so he didn't take <laughs> it in the face. Yeah. He, well, he learned after the first one. You learning. Mm -hmm. uh, think about it. How is Jesus' death on the cross associated with the sacrifice of the Passover lamb? Answer the following questions, which will help you note the parallels. The Passover lambs in Jesus' day were sacrificed at the sixth hour of the day before Passover. Read John 19, 14. According to this verse, when was Jesus handed over to be crucified? This actually gets to be one of the differences uh, between the Synoptic Gospels and John's Gospel is when events took place. In John's gospel, actually, um, Jesus was crucified on the day that the Passover lambs were slaughtered, which is actually the day before Passover. Synoptic gospels is actually at Passover itself. So it's one of, there is a slight timing difference between the sets of gospels. So that's, he's pointing something out here where it's, I'm pretty sure that he's gonna go for that thing. 19. Just says it was about noon. Well, no, it's the sixth hour of the preparation day of the Passover. Yeah. Yeah, this was the prepara preparation day for the Passover, and it was about right. noon. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, or 14. Where am I here? It was preparation day for the Passover, and it was about noon, and he said to the Jews, Behold, so the timing of it, right? So for John's gospel, because he wanted such a tight connection to this whole idea of the Pasch Paschal lamb, it's taking place on the day that the pa Passover lambs were slaughtered versus the synoptic gospels, which are important to have it be connected to the Passover itself, the meal, even though they're separated by a day. A technicality, but an important one. All right, what are the parallels between Jesus' death and John 1933? Now, since it was preparation day, right? So, mm -hmm. see how this is important to John. In order that the bodies might be... Uh, uh, might not be remain on the cross on the Sabbath, which would be Passover itself. But the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one. The Jews asked Pilate for their legs to be broken and taken down. So the soldiers came, broke the legs of the first, and the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. 
All right. And the Passover ritual in Exodus 12, 46. What was the significance of breaking the legs? Uh, that was... You, the, uh, they wanted them to die, but they didn't want them to die fast. So the breaking of legs would have broken blood vessels in their legs, and they would have slowly bled out inside. So it was it was a way, you know, the Romans were Brutal. <laughs> very methodic in their ways of killing people. They knew how to speed it up, how to slow it down. Um they were, you know, they're very cruel. So, all right. Uh, I think what I'm going to do is duplicate that. So, where was I again? What was I looking for? Exodus what? Exodus 46, 1246. Okay. Uh, it, it says that it must be eaten in one in the same house. You may not take any of it. Of its flesh outside the house, you shall not break any of its bones. Right. So, you see how the connection to everything going on in the Passover. Um, okay. All right, and parallels between Jesus' death and John 1929. There was a vessel filled with common wine, so they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it to his mouth, right? And Exodus um, 12, 22. 22. Right, so then take a bunch of his up, right? So that's what we just looked at. Mm -hmm. Okay. Think about it in light of all of this. What would be the meaning of addressing Jesus with the title Lamb of God in the Mass? Jesus is the, the Lamb of the New Covenant for once and for all to be slain and right. offered up. He's the ultimate Passover lamb, right? So he is the ultimate fulfillment of all of that stuff who had come before. Okay. Shortly before receiving communion in the mass, people kneel while the priest holds up the host and says, blessed are they who are called, blessed are those called to the supper of the lamb. This prayer echoes the words of the angel in the book of Revelation who invited St. John to participate in a great heavenly banquet. Read Revelation 19. The wedding feast of bride and bridegroom. Your last book. Uh, 1969. And I heard something like the sound of a great multitude or the sound of rushing water or mighty peals of thunder as they said, Alleluia, which means what again? The praise to praise the Lord. To God. The Lord has established his reign, our God, the Almighty. Remember, there was discussion in the book of how many times the uh, mm -hmm. Alleluia was um, used it was used a number of times in the old testament but in the new testament it was like six times or something and all of it in like this area of revelation or something like that all right to what kind of feast is the angel inviting saint john a wedding feast right for the wedding feet day of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready ready this part of the Mass, priest uses languages similar to the angel's invitation to the wedding supper of the Lamb. How might the Eucharist be like a marriage feast? More specifically, how might Holy Communion be similar to communion between husband and wife? Uh, 
that unites, unites Jesus with the body of the church. And it's an intimate union bond, just like a marriage of a man and woman. Right. Very good. All right. Lord, I am not worthy. In response to the priest's announcement of blessing upon those called to the supper of the Lamb, the people say, Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. In this prayer, the Mass draws our attention to the words of the Roman centurion who came to Jesus with great faith, asking for his servant to be healed. Read Matthew 8, 5 to 10. About this, but all right, healing of the centurion servant. When he entered Capernaum, a centurion approached him and appealed to him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, suffering dreadfully. Said to him, I will come and cure him. Interesting, it's headed that way, but he didn't. The centurion said to in reply, Lord, I am not worthy to have you under my roof. Only say the word, and my servant shall be healed. For I too am a person subject to authority, with subject, soldiers subject to me. And I say to one, go, and one goes, and to another, come here, and he comes, and my slave do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed, and those following, amen, I say to you, no one in Israel have I found such faith. I say to you, many will come from the east and west, who are reclined with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the banquet of uh, the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom will be driven out into the outer darkness where there'll be wailing and grinding of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, you may go as you have believed, let it be done for you. And at that very hour, his servant was healed. Okay. Uh, how does the centurion exhibit great faith in this passage? Even though he wasn't necessarily a follower of Jesus, he had acknowledged Jesus as who he was and the power that he had. And, and he comes from his own power and just trusted him to be able to help his servant. Mm -hmm. Place that same trust in him. Right. So he believed that, you know, he didn't need Jesus to come there. He believed enough that if he just willed it, it would happen. How does the centurion exhibit? Do you think, do you think that uh, the centurion knew of some of the other miracles that Jesus had performed earlier in his life? You know, I like, would have to, you know, he'd have to have, you know, for him to even to come to him, right? Because uh, you think about the situation we're in, Romans, you know, a centurion too, right, is a person of power within the Roman um, military hierarchy. And all of a sudden here, you know, this, comes to a lowly itinerant Jewish preacher, you know, asking for a servant, you know, to be healed. That just would not happen, you know what I mean, spontaneously without knowing some of what was going on. You know, it's kind of funny if you watch the movies about this, usually the centurion, I'm trying to think of which one it was in particular, but, you know, different events that Jesus was at, the centurion, you know, this, this particular centurion, and this is all, you know, apoc you know, apocryphic, whatever. I can't say that word <laughs> outside of the canon of scripture. But um, you know, was usually somebody who had been following Jesus around. You know, was security making sure that the you know the Jews weren't getting out of hand, but had witnessed some of this stuff that had taken place. You know, as being part of the Roman legions who were making sure that the the Jews were under control, and then all of a sudden, you know, this trusted servant, you know, becomes ill, and because of what he had personally witnessed, that's what it was. You know, it's, that's the movies, right? Um, but you would have to think, it, you know, he's actually had to have heard stories or seen something to kind of go from his position of power to asking, you know, this Jew, you know, to help him out. There'd have to have been something there. Um, so what about humility? Well, the whole, I'm, that he was unworthy. Mm -hmm. Right. 
I think you just said it though. I think someone of his power and authority to come to a, like you said, an itinerant Jewish preacher and ask for that shows a lot of humility, it seems to me. So do you think he uh, actually put himself at risk, though? Because historically, you see a lot of, um, you know, um, Jews were, Ju were Jewish communities stayed within the Jewish community, and then the centurions, the Romans, stayed within theirs. Um, and then sometimes what you would see is a lot of, you know, persecution of anybody who would um, cross those uh, cultural barriers, if you will. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I also think that the centurion in his act of faith um, also was risking a lot, like his own position or his own, even potentially his own life or freedom within uh, what would be typically the Roman Empire. Yeah, you tend to probably think that that would be uh, true. You know, um, the Romans allowed a certain degree of religious freedom, mostly as an aid to help subjugate the people that they had, right? So they gave them that ability to worship as long as it wasn't a threat to the emperor, right? Who, you know, the Romans oftentimes, you know, different points in their history saw as gods themselves, right? The Roman emperor. Right. So as long as it wasn't a threat, um, you know, but a Roman to convert to this would, you would have to think would be a problem because they would have certainly seen the Roman, you know, pantheon of gods and the emperor as being superior to any local religious practice. And all of a sudden, if you were to give that up, you would have to think there would be as, you know, they'd be ostracized from Roman society. All right. Um, so where are we at here? 7a. Think about it. What similarities are there between what Jesus offered to do for the centurion and what Jesus actually does for those who receive him in communion? Hmm. He heals us. He heals us if we have the faith. I'm just it's kind of curious. I wasn't exactly sure where he's going with this, but I'll, I'll tell you what they put in the. This is the first time I ever looked at the what they got for answers in here. Um, in, in Matthew 8, Jesus offers to go to the centurion's house to bring healing there. At Mass, Jesus lovingly comes to us in the Eucharist to bring healing to our souls and to fill us with his life. How should we imitate the centurion's response to Jesus' desire to come to his house when we are at Mass? Humble. Okay. Approaching in humility. Mm -hmm. Be faithful. Okay. Mm -hmm. but I think, you know, too, it's, it's believing what Jesus says is true, right? You know, you look at, you know, the centurion, um, mm -hmm. you know, knew that Jesus could do you know, this healing of his servant. So, you know, he had that deep belief in what was taking place, you know, so it's kind of for us, you know, of entering in with that deep kind of faith of believing that what appears bread is no longer bread, you know, that it's now, um, you know, the body of Christ, that what, that Jesus has that power to do that thing, you know, to make himself, um, you know, present in that, Eucharist. Um, all right, eight. Think about it echoing the words of the centurion. We pray that the Lord say only the word and our souls shall be. 
From what do we need to be healed as we prepare Jesus at his Holy Communion? 1385. All right. 85 and 86. To respond to this invitation, we must prepare ourselves for so great and so holy a moment. St. Paul urges us to examine our conscience. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself. Anyone conscious of a grave sin must receive the sacrament of reconciliation before coming to communion. 86. Before so great a sacrament, the faithful can only echo humbly and with the ardent faith the words of the centurion. Okay, so Latin. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul will be healed. In the divine liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, the faithful pray in the same spirit, O Son of God, Bring me into communion today with your mystical supper. Shall not tell your enemies the secret nor kiss you with Judas's kiss. But like the good thief, I cry, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. All right. The liturgy of John um, is a, John Chrysostom is part of the Eastern rites of the church. And um, so it's a, a Byzantine liturgy. All right, concluding rites. Go forth, the Mass is ended. So is that, going back, sorry, um, is that prayer, um, you should um, only say the word and my soul should be healed, is that just another prayer of forgiveness before we enter into communion? Right. Prayer, you know, demonstrating humility, you know, again, connecting it up with the idea of the centurion, that he humbled himself from being from this position of power to, you know, approaching the Lord who was, you know, at least in societal terms, somebody much lower. So now here we are approaching our Lord in this appearance of bread, humbling ourselves, you know, to receive him, um, you know, as well that because uh, we're not worthy, you know, to receive them. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. The whole liturgy receives its name, the mass from the closing line of the Latin text where the word Misa Latin for dismissal or sending is used to dismiss the people. This points to why the mass should be seen as a sending forth. Read the passages. What is Jesus sending his followers to do? Matthew 28. And 19 to 20. All right, so this is section <coughs> disciples. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. So what is Jesus sending his followers to do? To go out and preach. To spread the word. Right, so he's going out telling them to go out and make disciples. Baptize them in the, in the name of the Trinity, Holy, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then teach them all that I, to observe all that I have commanded you. And then promises to be with them until the end of the age. All right, so almost at the end of the discussion hour here. So let's move to the B. What are we called to do as we are set forth from the Mass? CCC 1332. This 
The Holy Mass, Misa, because of the liturgy in which the mystery of salvation is accomplished, concludes the sending forth of the faithful so that they may fulfill God's will in their daily lives. So what does that mean to you? That we reflect uh, Christ's life and what we say and do and share what we received just prior in, in the Mass that when we received communion um, to others, right. towards others. Okay. Anything else about that? That they're sending us forth to spread the news. Okay, right. So we actually kind of go forth to participate in that, what we just looked at, the great commission of the disciples to go out, you know, to all the nations, um, teach them all that he has commanded. You know, we all share in that, right? We may not always do the act of baptizing or whatever, but all of us are in the, in the, the business of evangelization, of, um, you know, spreading the good news. Um, okay. I think there's one other thing too, and I guess I'll just bring it up, is that we're changed by what we do, that hopefully when we go out back out into the world, we don't immediately forget what we had just done, right? That we'd come and given, you know, praise and thanks and worship to God, received his son in his body and blood, and then go out immediately and start running right back into our normal sinful life. You know what I mean? Like that whole hour had no meaning whatsoever. Um, but it's so easy for us to compartmentalize that stuff that, you know, the hour, you know, that we spend together, you know, that even if we, you know, participate well in it, that uh, immediately when we leave, we go back to whatever, you know, flipping off the driver in the car next door or whatever, you know <laughs> what I mean, that makes us angry as we're driving down the road or whatever, you know what I mean? How many stupid things we do every day that immediately leads us back into sinfulness. You know, we want to be changed by what we have just done, you know, that it hopefully makes us different instead of, you know, um, just going back to what we were before. That's the real fruit of the mass, is that we're different as a result of the experience. Any questions, comments, concerns, whatever, before we go to the video? Okay, let me get that thing rolling. Let me stop sharing that. There's some recording. we arrive at our last session together on our biblical walk through the mass everybody here okay we looked at the introductory rites which prepare us for yes. our with god's word and our encounter sacramentally with our lord in the eucharist then we actually looked at the second major part of the mass which is the liturgy of the word and then we considered last session the beginning parts of the liturgy of the eucharist the preparation of the gifts and the eucharistic prayer itself what we're going to do in this fourth concluding session today is take a look at that last part of the liturgy of the eucharist which is called the communion rite and then we're going to move to the very end of the mass in the closing part known as the concluding mm -hmm. okay. so let's take a look now at the communion rite which begins with a prayer we're very familiar with the prayer known as the lord's prayer or the our father this is what really kicks off our final preparations as we are about to enter the most intimate union we could ever have with God here on earth in Holy Communion. We begin our final preparations with the words our Savior taught us, the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father. One of the introductions to this prayer by the priest, one of the options, he has various options he could use to lead us into this prayer. One of them is this, quote, at the Savior's command, 
and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say. And then we come in and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now, that line is striking. We dare to say. What's so daring about saying the Our Father? Most of us have grown up praying the Our Father. We were taught it as little kids. Some of us may pray this prayer every day. What's so bold and daring about praying the Our Father? Well, let's go back to the biblical background here. The Jews viewed God as the Father of Israel, the Father of the chosen people as a whole. But it was not so common for a particular individual to address God as his Father. And yet, here Jesus tells us to call on God as our very Father. And if this prayer was given in Jesus' original language, Aramaic, he may have actually used the word Abba for Father, as he did elsewhere. For example, in Mark 14, 36, the word Abba, which has a very endearing tone to it. It implies an intimate relationship with one's Father. It's almost, some people would translate it maybe loosely, but like Daddy. So we could call God our Father is astonishing. And yet, this isn't just some metaphoric relationship. It's not just a nice figurative way term we use to describe God. God is like our Father. That is not what we're doing when we pray the Lord's Prayer. St. John, in his first letter, chapter 3, verse 1, underscores the profound realism of our relationship with God as Father. That he truly becomes our Father by grace. That we truly are his sons and daughters. These aren't just nice little metaphors. We really become, in some way, we become his sons and daughters. Listen to what St. John says. St. John says in 1 John 3, verse 1, See what love the Father has for us, that we should be called sons of God. And so we are. Did you catch that? St. John didn't say, oh, isn't it wonderful that we can be called sons of God? He didn't put a period there. He said, we're not just called sons of God, we're called sons of God because we really are sons of God. And so we are. What does this mean? Well, what this is pointing to is the unique divine life that we have dwelling within us. By virtue of our baptisms, we have the life of the Son of God dwelling within us. This is a Catholic understanding of sanctifying grace. What is grace? Many Christians love to talk about grace. They sing songs about grace, about how it's so amazing, right? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. It's saved a wretch like me. Grace is amazing, yes, but what is grace? Many Christians say, well, grace, it's a gift, free gift. True, there are a lot of things that are gifts. But what is the specific gift of grace? Grace is Christ, according to the Catechism, Christ's divine life dwelling within us. Christ's very divine life dwelling within us. We have the life of the Son of God dwelling within us. And that's not just some nice, warm, fuzzy feeling, Jesus in my heart. No, this is profoundly real. Jesus is very divine, like the life of the Son, eternal Son of God, the life that gives himself totally in love to the Father for all eternity. That Son of God that took on human flesh and dwelt among us and continued to give himself radically to the Father, ultimately, as seen on the cross, where he gives his whole life to the Father, that life of the Son of God is dwelling in each of us by virtue of our baptism. So that we can begin to love, not with our own weak, fallen, human, frail love that's tainted by much pride and selfishness and greed, but we can begin to love others with Christ's love, Christ's life, working through us. So we could say like St. Paul, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And that's a profound gift that we need. Because in our various responsibilities, our missions in life, our fundamental relationships with God, with our spouses, with our children, with our friends, we need God's grace, don't we? My wife deserves a lot more than Ted Sree's fallen, selfish human love. She needs Christ working through me to love her. My kids deserve a lot more than my fallen love. They need Christ working through me. And in the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer and the Liturgy, we're reminded that God has truly become our Father. 
and we really have this profound life of the Son within us so that we can love God as Father way beyond what we could do with our own fallen humanness. And we can love one another well beyond what we could do with our own weakness. So we can dare to say, our Father, God has come to this intimate relationship with us. He's given us the life of his own Son dwelling in us so we can truly call him Father because he really is. And we really are called sons of God because we really are by grace. Now, there's another line in here that's significant, and that is the word our. We say our Father. Now, this points to the communal dimension of our faith. That yes, God is my Father, but if we say our Father all together, what are we saying here? We're saying that we all are brothers and sisters in the same family of God. We all are united in Jesus Christ, and by virtue of this union in Christ's life that dwells within us, God is our common Father by grace. So, once again, by baptism, you and I have a profound, real relationship as brothers and sisters. Sometimes Christians use this term, we're brothers and sisters, and they think we're just talking metaphorically. We're not. You realize there are a number of you here that I have never met before. I have never met before, and yet you and I have a more profound bond of brother and sisterhood than I would on the natural level with my siblings, Tom and Melissa, back in Chicago. Because we're baptized. We have the life of the Son of God dwelling within us. These are bonds that if we're faithful to our baptism, we will be bonded together as brothers and sisters. Now, by the way, Tom and Melissa are baptized too, so I have that bond with them as well. But the point is, this is this is real. We really are brothers and sisters. And so as we're preparing to receive our Lord in Holy Communion, we cry out, Our Father. We're recognizing the bond we already share. And as we're about to receive our Lord Jesus in Holy Communion, that bond with our God and that bond with each other is about to be strengthened. It's about to be deepened. So we say, Our Father. Now, after the Our Father, there's this line that we say, it is, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. And some people wonder about this prayer. Some people have attended a Protestant church. They wonder, that sounds like the Protestant ending to the Our Fathers, what some people call that. Uh, many Protestants will put the, that line at the end of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, where do, why do we not have that at the end of the Lord's Prayer? In our mass we use it in the liturgy it just comes a little bit later well this line for the kingdom the power and the glory are yours now and forever you will not find in the Bible in the prayer that Jesus taught us when he taught the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6 or Luke 11 he did not include those words and that's why it's fitting that in the liturgy we don't include them actually in the Lord's Prayer itself at mass it's not to say these words are beautiful and important. We know that some of the earliest Christians used those words. In a text known as the DDK, the Teaching of the Twelve Apostles, in early Christianity, they use those very words as a prayer of thanksgiving. But those words reach even farther back, even into the Old Testament. King David spoke very similar words in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 10 through 11. Nearing the end of his life and his reign, the great David who was given the great kingdom, the great covenant promises, he at the end of his life realizes all that he had, all that he accomplished was not of his own power and ability. It was all from God. And he gives God the due reverence and praise. He says, quote, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory. Thine is the kingdom. So these are beautiful biblical words. I think they fit very well in the liturgy. Maybe not right after the Lord's Prayer, but it's beautiful that we include this in there. So we're recognizing God, ultimately, he's the one that deserves all the glory, all the praise, all the honor. He's the true king. We accept and welcome the kingdom that we just prayed for in the Our Father. We welcome that into our own hearts today. Now, there's another part of the communion rite that comes. Uh, after the sign of peace, something that's uh, the theme of peace, a powerful theme that throughout the scripture, especially in the New Testament, you know the early Christians it gave a sign of peace, a kiss of peace, some exchange that expressed this biblical understanding of shalom and right relationship. Uh, right after that, we pray the Agnus Dei, Latin for Lamb of God. Let's talk about the prayer known as the Lamb of God. We say, 
Lamb of God, and take away the sins of the world. What would this recall? Well, we've already seen the theme of the Lamb in the Eucharistic prayer, haven't we? That would recall the Passover lambs. In Egypt, the Israelites in Exodus 12 were called to take a lamb and sacrifice it. And those Jews that participated in that ritual, what happened? They were spared the death that came in the 10th plague. And so Jesus becomes later associated with this great lamb of God who lays down his life so that we can be spared uh, and, and, and receive the great salvation that Jesus has come to offer us. So lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, would recall on a basic level the Old Testament Passover lamb and associate Jesus with it once again. But secondly, this line would also recall another passage we've come across, and that is Isaiah chapter 53. That's that passage about the suffering servant that we looked at in our last session. That was the prophecy about a great servant figure who would come in Isaiah 53 verse 7. He would be led like a lamb to the slaughter. In Isaiah 53 verse 10 and following, he would offer his life as an offering for sin. And the sacrifice would make many righteous in Isaiah 53, verse 11. So Jesus being described as the lamb who takes away the sins of the world, this would definitely bring to mind the suffering servant of Isaiah, who laid down his life as a sacrifice for sin and made many people righteous. Jesus is that lamb led to the slaughter of Isaiah 53, that's, who sacrificed his life for sin. But the clearest biblical allusion to this line in the Lamb of God prayer comes in John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 29. These are the words of John the Baptist. John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It's one of the first titles someone else gives to Jesus in the New Testament period. In Jesus' adult life and his public ministry, John the Baptist sees Jesus and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John the Baptist is the one who identifies Jesus as the great Lamb led to the slaughter, the suffering servant, Isaiah 53. We echo that every time we pray the Lamb of God. And how fitting that we do this in the Mass. Because what just happened? In the middle of the Eucharistic prayer, Christ's sacrifice was made present to us. The sacrifice of Christ made present sacramentally in the liturgy of the Eucharist, with the words of consecration. And so it's fitting that we pray that Jesus is the Lamb of God. We acknowledge that he's the one whose sacrifice took away the sins of the world. And it's his very body and blood that was offered up on Calvary that we are about to receive in Holy Communion. So we are acknowledging that this is, yes, Jesus' body and blood, but we remember that he gave his body and blood for our sins. Now, right before we come up, surely before we come up for Holy Communion, the priest holds up the host and he says these words, blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. I want you to open up your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 19, the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation chapter 19. Because these words are taken almost verbatim out of a, something one of the angels says in Revelation chapter 19. I want to make sure you get the background to fully appreciate this call to the Supper of the Lamb. First of all, in Revelation 19, we're going to see Passover Eucharistic imagery. And then we're also going to see some Eucharistic imagery as well. Or, I'm sorry, uh, marital imagery as well. Let's take a look at the Passover imagery here. In Revelation 19, we read about verse 1, a great multitude in heaven crying out, Alleluia, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. And then in verse 3, once more they cried, Alleluia, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. Verse 4, four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. Verse 6, he hears a great multitude, like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of many thunder peals, crying, Alleluia, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. We hear four times 
in the opening six verses of chapter 19 in the book of Revelation, four times, what's the key word we hear? Alleluia, 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 alleluia. This is an important liturgical word used in the Old Testament. It was used many times in the Psalms. In fact, there are a whole set of Psalms known as the Hallel Psalms because they have this expression, Alleluia, which means praise to the Lord, praise Yahweh. And so this important liturgical word, though, is found very few times in the New Testament. You see it many times in the Old, but it's only found four times in the entire New Testament. And all four come right here in rapid-fire succession in Revelation 19. We as readers, if we're careful readers of the Bible, should be having our, uh, our ears very much attuned. Something big is about to happen. We're reading about four alleluias. Now, something interesting about this, the sudden course of alleluias that would bring to mind these Hallel Psalms, uh, the, 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 that might also bring to mind many of the Jewish feasts that use the Hallel Psalms, particularly the Passover. The Hallel Psalms were sung in the context of the Passover. Jesus and his apostles may very well have been singing those psalms when the gospel reports how they left the Last Supper singing. So, Alleluia may bring to mind the Passover. But then when you read about Alleluia, 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 and then what happens next, what does it say? Verse 7, let us rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. Alleluia, four times Halal Psalms might bring to mind Passover, but when you read about the Lamb, now we're really thinking about that. So we read about a Lamb, and then the angel says, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So we read about a Lamb, and we read about the supper of the Lamb. It'd be kind of like if I said turkey, you might think of Thanksgiving. But I said Turkey dinner, you're definitely thinking about Thanksgiving, right? Uh, so now all of a sudden you read about lamb, and then you read lamb supper, alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. In the light of the, the book of Revelation, I think we'd see there's a lot of Passover imagery being alluded to here. And in the book of Revelation in the New Testament, the new Passover would have some type of Eucharistic overtones. But more to the point for our purposes is to examine 19 verse 9. It's Revelation chapter 19, verse 9. Blessed are those who are called to the wedding supper of the Lamb. This is what the angel announces. And the priest at Mass is echoing these very words of the angels. Blessed are those who are called to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Here we have the great coming of the Lamb. And the Lamb is coming with this Passover, possible Eucharistic overtones here. But he's also coming as a bridegroom. There's going to be a great Passover feast. But this Passover feast is also a great wedding feast. So as a friend of mine says, the lamb is coming dressed like a t in a tuxedo. <laughs> he's coming as the bridegroom. Uh, and this imagery of the husband and the wife, the bride and the bridegroom, is used many times throughout the Bible. In the Bible, there are various images used to describe our relationship with God. God is Lord. He's creator. He's the lawgiver. He's the all-powerful one. He's the all-holy one. Many titles for God. God also uses family language, as we've seen, to describe his relationship with his people. God is Father. Jesus is our brother. But the most intimate, familial term God uses to describe his union with us is that of a relationship between a husband and a wife, a bride and a bridegroom, marriage in heaven. And in the Bible, the prophets saw that God had married Israel. They established their covenant at Mount Sinai with the giving of the law. And then the, the desert period is kind of like the, the honeymoon years. And when Israel is faithful to the covenant, they're like the spotless bride, the pure spouse. But when Israel breaks covenant, when Israel starts worshiping other gods, guess what this bride is called in the prophets in the Old Testament? She's called an adulteress. She's described as an unfaithful wife. She's described, when it gets really bad, as a harlot, as a prostitute. So biblical uh, language uses this, this, this image of marriage to describe the intimate union God wants to have 
with his people. That is, even though Israel had been unfaithful, the prophets had foretold, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and especially Hosea, they foretold that one day God would come as bridegroom and reunite himself to his unfaithful spouse. That even though his people had been unfaithful, God would remain committed to them and seek her out and woo her back and betroth her to himself again, renew his covenant. And when we get to the book of Revelation, we get to the climax of this marital reunion between God and his people who had gone astray through their many infidelities. So here at the book of Revelation, at the end, we are approaching this climactic union between God and his people. Now think about this. At Mass, the priest echoes those words of the angel in Revelation 19. The priest says, blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. He's echoing that angelic invitation. So do, do you realize that? Every time you go to Mass and you hear the priest as he's holding up the host say, blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb, did you realize you're getting a, an invitation? It's a wedding invitation. You read a wedding invitation in the mail? That's what's happening. Because he's repeating those words of the angel, inviting people to the wedding supper of the Lamb. When the Lamb, Jesus Christ, is coming to unite himself with his people. And you're getting a wedding invitation to the wedding supper of the Lamb, this heavenly banquet. And when you come down the aisle to receive Holy Communion, do you realize that you are not any ordinary guest at this wedding? You're not just showing up. You're not just someone putting your name in the guest registry. Who are you in light of the biblical imagery? You are the bride. You are the bride. You as a member of the church are the bride. And so you're coming down the aisle to receive communion. It's almost like here comes the bride. And what's happening is our divine bridegroom is coming to unite himself to us in the most intimate way possible here on earth. He gives his very body to us, uniting himself to us. You think of the most intimate union two persons can have here on earth, physically. Jesus, our bridegroom, gives his very body and blood to us for the most intimate union we can have with him this side of eternity. So, in a certain sense, we could look at marriage as a sacrament of communion, but so is the Eucharist, a sacrament of Holy Communion. This is why it's so important for us to really take that time to be with our Lord and to pray with him, our bridegroom, as he is dwelling within us. Those intimate moments after Holy Communion. The wonderful tradition of thanksgiving. Where Catholics would, at, at the end of Mass, kneel down and say some prayers and be with our Lord. This is the time to give our Lord, uh, uh, pour out our hearts to him, to love him, to adore him, to thank him, as he is intimately dwelling within us. Now, here I'm reminded of something what's that, that John Paul II said about those intimate moments after Holy Communion. He once reflected on what it would have been like for Mary, the Blessed Virgin Mary, to receive Holy Communion. You ever wonder about what Mary's first Holy Communion would have been like? How amazing that would have been. Listen to what John Paul II says about Mary and the First Holy Communion. He says, first of all, quote, Mary lived her Eucharistic faith even before the institution of the Eucharist by the very fact that she offered her virginal womb for the incarnation of God's word. So in other words, for those nine months, Mary had Jesus' body and blood dwelling within her. She has Jesus himself dwelling within her womb for those nine months during the pregnancy. JP2 goes on to say, at the Annunciation, Mary conceived the Son of God in the physical reality of his body and blood, thus anticipating within herself what to some degree happens sacramentally in every believer who receives under the signs of bread and, blood, uh, bread and wine the Lord's body and blood. So Mary anticipates the Eucharistic faith by conceiving Jesus, having Jesus conceived in her womb, she anticipates what happens to us believers who have Jesus sacramentally within us in the real presence of the Eucharist. And now he goes on to talk about what 
it would have been like for Mary to hear about what happened at the Last Supper. She would have had to have learned from the other apostles what that was all about. What must Mary have felt, JP2 says, as she heard from the mouth of Peter, John, James, and the other apostles, the words spoken at the Last Supper, this is my body, which is given for you. The body given up for us and made present under sacramental signs was the same body which she had received, conceived in her womb. Then John Paul II concludes, for Mary, receiving the Eucharist must have somehow meant welcoming once more into her womb that heart that had beat in unison with hers. That heart which beat in unison with hers for those nine months of the pregnancy. And then she watched her son in his public ministry be rejected, be killed, raised, and then ascended into heaven. And yet, when she would go to Mass, celebrate the Eucharist, she would receive the body and blood of that son, whose heart had beat in unison with hers in those nine months long ago. So now we have a profound reunion between Mary and her son in every Holy Communion. And in a certain sense, we become like Mary each time we receive Holy Communion. Mary had Jesus in her womb for nine months. We have Jesus dwelling within us sacramentally in the Eucharist for nine or 19 minutes, however long the species uh, of the Eucharist remains. Jesus is dwelling within us. Think about how Mary would have been so careful, so attentive to Jesus dwelling within her. I think about any mom carrying a baby in her womb. You know how exciting that is. And making contact with that child, being so careful as you're walking around, not wanting to do anything that might hurt the child. But imagine if you were Mary, you don't have just any child. You have the Son of God, the great Messiah, dwelling within you. And yet, we experience something like that each time we have received Holy Communion, to some degree, as John Paul II says, we experience that. That's why we should give special attention to Jesus in those moments after Communion, really giving him time, tenderly resting with him, like a bridegroom and his bride. Now, I want to share a story with you uh, about John Paul II, who really had a great Eucharistic devotion, and uh, he once was visiting a parish in Rome. You know, he's the bishop of Rome. He's not just the pope, he's the bishop of Rome. And he would go and visit various parishes. And one time he went to a small parish in Rome, and there were hundreds of people that showed up. Everyone showed up for church that day, because uh, the pope was coming there. And after Mass, they were all outside, you know, lined up, rushing out there, getting ready to greet him, because they're all excited, they want to meet the pope. And he just stayed inside the church for a half hour, making a Thanksgiving. A half hour just resting there and praying. And some of us could look at that and say, well, gosh, he should, have, he should have gone out there and, you know, attended to the people. But yet, he really, you know, he did come out and he spent a lot of time with them afterwards. But he gave, he put first things first. And he gave his fullest attention to Jesus for that half hour after communion. I'm not saying we all have to spend a half hour after Mass. If we could, that would be wonderful. Most of us probably do do that in life. Practicalities of our daily living. But can we spend some time with him? Can we spend a few minutes? Can we spend five or ten minutes after Mass? Or are we going to be rushing out to race to get out of the parking lot quickly, to rush home for the football game, or, or go out and get those coffee and donuts that they often have after Masses? Or will we put first things first, which is to spend time with our Lord, resting with him, loving him, adoring him, praising him? There's no better time to give our Lord that loving attention and right after receiving him, the Holy Communion. Now, let's conclude with the concluding rite uh, where the priest gives the final blessing. And then he has this line where he says, uh, he uses the word the Mass. Now, why, why do we have this word the Mass? Why is the Mass called the Mass? Many people wonder. The word Mass is derived from the Latin word Misa, which is a Latin word for dismissal or sending that was used to formally conclude a gathering, a large meeting. And the early Christians took on that word, but Christians then saw a profound meaning in this word, that the liturgy with its misa, its dismissal, its sending, wasn't simply a conclusion. 
it wasn't an aimless dismissal. Okay, everybody just go off their own separate ways. But the, the word Misa in the catechism, is they, they connect it with another word, Missio, mission. It's a sending forth where now that we've encountered the sacred mysteries of the Mass, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, the Paschal mystery that's made present to us that we participated, the reception of Jesus, his body and blood and Holy Communion, now we're called to go out into the world and bring that into our homes, into our friendships, into our country, into our workplace, and be light to this world, to be salt to this earth. We are sent on mission at the end of every liturgy. Let's close with the glory be in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Well, that's it. <laughs> what do you think? It's good. It's good. Was it worthwhile the last five weeks? Yes. 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 I think so. Okay, good. Yeah, I think it was a, a good um, experience to go through this and learn a few things in the process. So, good to hear. Yeah, thank you, Father. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Well, thanks to everybody for participating. Um, I really appreciated you taking the time to do it. Uh, now that we're starting to try to slowly get back to Mass, hopefully, you know, it enriches your experience of it, you know, to little, know a little more about, you know, where the different parts came from, how they're tied to Scripture, you know, what it means, um, different signs and symbols and all those kind of things that we do so so good well thank you everybody i appreciate your taking it the time being a part of this um it's been uh interesting for me too you know so I learn a lot of these things at seminary but you kind of over time forget a few things so it's good to make you go back and look at stuff every once in a while too all right then. Well, unless anybody's got anything else, that's just all. want to thank you, Father, for taking your time to do this with us too. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate thank that. You. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thanks, thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, hopefully we'll uh, see you in church soon. Okay. Yeah. Sounds very good. soon. <laughs> Thanks, Father. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you again. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.